On May 31st, 1995, Jennifer Fairgate checked into the prestigious Radisson Blue Plaza Hotel, but never checked out. Missing identification, a locked door on an upper floor, few witnesses, and a gunshot left this crime scene a baffling mystery. Today we discuss the true crime case of the Oslo Plaza woman. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to another episode of Red Web, the show all about the unsolved mysteries of this world, everything from the paranormal to true crime, and sometimes some internet mysteries. I am your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, joining me, hearing this mystery for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. Looks like we've got a missing persons case on our hands, gentlemen. Uh, Christian, where were you the night of the disappearance? Like, I'm not the fo- focal point of the story here. Let's get back to what Trevor's That's not a good alibi. Uh, I don't think right, right, right. Up. That sounded uh, suspicious. It, it did. Uh, it I will say, it's not a missing persons. Oh. I didn't want to mislead you. Uh, we were dabbling outside of... So I, I do the hook, and that is Alfredo's first impression it is. into this mystery. And in this particular case, uh, as Christian was printing off some of the images that I have for you, Alfredo, oh. and Task Force, you'll be able to see those on our social, at Red Web Pod. Oh, the person very uh, much isn't missing. We were conversating, and I said something about, you know, I, I might have misled you. It, they're not missing. It's they are very much... Case. It's a true crime case. It is a murder case. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, she checked did. in. What? But she never... <laughs> oh, you're right. I mean... I mean, yeah. bullet hole. Where was the... There was multiple chairs seen at the crime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, damn. Okay, yeah, checked in. Um, you did say that there was like out. a a bullet hole. That's true. There was a gunshot heard. There are some bullet holes to be seen. A lot of mysterious details. It feels pretty straightforward. Feels like something that could have been solved, but there's a few nuances to this case that left it kind of a cold case that yeah. leave it open-ended. And we're going to dive into that. We're going to talk about all the details as to this person, all the intrigue that leads up to their death. And then we're going to talk about the police investigation at that time. And then flash forward almost 20 years, there was a follow-up investigation by another person who re-dug into the case, looked at the timeline, found some inconsistencies. And then obviously we're going to follow up with the theories, not only from the theory in the 90s of, of the police investigation, but also what people kind of think could also be in play with some of the missing elements. So it's a very fascinating case, and it also relates to another mystery we've talked about before, at least location-wise. It makes me, like, wonder, um, because you know you talked about how uh, there's been, like, newer discoveries more recently. Yes. As opposed to when this happened. It makes me wonder, because, you know, we had, like, a giant leap in... Like, uh, I guess, like true crime work, right? With the invention of like fingerprint detection, mm-hmm. DNA was another big DNA is a huge one. Technology is like uh, another big one now, right? Yeah, with like cameras and tracking with phones, stuff like that. I'm very eager to see what the next big jump is. I am too, you know? Yeah. I wonder if it'll be like a uh, a very high fidelity camera situation. I mean, we're already very close, but like a high fidelity scan of the environment so that way you can get into it VR wise, AR, VR, True. investigate the crime scene without getting people on it. Yeah. We're already very close. Yeah. You that know? kind of makes me think, I wonder if there's like a list of crimes that have been solved because of like uh, Google Street View. Ooh. There's got to be, right? Right. I feel like by digging into Google Street View, which kind of refreshes every few years. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if there's any mysteries that have been solved via Google Street View. Yeah. Just because the happenstance of the the car with the cameras attached all over yeah. it. That's how they get that. Could you imagine? Drove by, you're, took a bunch of videos. The <laughs> chance, the luck. The chance the, that you're the a criminal. Luck. You're like, man, I got away with it. Scott Free, you step out of the bank right when the Google Street View car <laughs> oh, drives by. Goodness. You're like, oh, man. Yep, you got got. You got got. All right, well, let's dig into this case. Very fascinating one. Takes us back to the 90s, which, as you kind of astutely pointed out, is essentially the turn of the DNA element, right? So somewhere between the early mid-90s and into the 2000s is the advent of DNA profiling, being able to take someone's blood, sample it, and then run that against a backlog of individuals. So, you know, minor spoiler, that does come into play. For this case. So for the backlog, I guess they have to have already been in the system, right? I think that's, yeah. 
Like, you got to build a library of people. Right. And how do they do that? I don't know if it's like well, an at birth thing, mm-hmm. if you donate blood thing, or if they oh, just kind of get you in the night, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you wake uh, up with a sore neck, you're like, mm, I slept on it weird. Like, no. A doctor <laughs> came in. Someone came in, the user nails to scrape it so they can get the DNA in the fingernails. <laughs> um, yeah, because like, say if someone was trying to match my DNA mm-hmm. right now. Do you think they could? I don't think they could. Have you done 23 and Me? No. Have you done Ancestry? No. Have you given blood? Once. Okay, there it is. So it might it might be that. But I mean, like, damn, the one time in the 34 years I've been here. Yeah. Because the only other know, time is honestly. like, I guess like birth, blood donation, blood draws. Yeah. I don't know if they do but any. I don't like, think they do that, though. It was also a question of like, yeah, if you go to get a physical and get blood drawn, are they like sharing that with authorities? Be like, hey, just for your record. This, okay, we're just showing our ignorance. I'm very <laughs> curious, Christian, if like, because this has I'm always so, been a question I, on I my mind. I think this is important for the task force. Oh, no, like, this is so curious. Like, are, are you task force? Are you in the database? Like, if, you know I've what I mean? If they're trying to this. match your DNA, like, I don't know. Yeah. I have I no wanna clue. Say, I've heard, I don't know how accurate this is. I could be just like completely misremembering, but I want to say I've heard that that conception or that is a misconception about like, you know, looking for them in the fingerprint database or whatever, because I want to say I've heard that the only reason you would be in a fingerprint database is if you get your fingerprints taken. Yeah. yeah. So it's almost like establishing whether or not you have a criminal past. Right. Or right. If you're a first timer, just... there's no way to really know. And granted, I think, I don't like know if, if you correct. have committed a crime, your chances yeah. are way higher to recommit a crime. Sure. Right. That's true. Um, so I, I guess the main thing there is to match against people who have done crimes because they're more likely so i i doubt like our dna and our fingerprints are in the system probably not i uh, want that someone I want in the that. task force <laughs> task force need well, to let ta- us we know. have task force members that work and yes. like the like the you know, crime investigation or like uh finger work with fingerprints uh Absolutely. DNA stuff. so one of them will ping us and be like this is in fact true Right, and we'll follow <laughs> up in a future true. episode yeah. with a non sequitur. Or <laughs> sorry, I know we spun off, but that's just so, no. just an interesting thing. Yes, because I'm just and like, it is a, a cornerstone well, yeah, to kinda, the revisit yeah. of this case. So I, I do want to actually talk about it a little bit. But yeah, without further ado, let's yep. talk about the Oslo Plaza woman, also known as the Jennifer Fairgate mystery. And before we begin, as always, a list of sensitive topics will be included in the episode description. On Wednesday, May 31st, 1995, a woman named Jennifer Fairgate checked into the Radisson Blue Plaza Hotel in Oslo, Norway, around 10.44 p.m. She had called the hotel previously on May 22nd, but then called on the 31st to say that yet another person, Louis Fairgate, would actually be arriving that evening. Now, things are going to get a little twisty-turvy. There's a lot of dates, a lot of times, so if you get lost, feel free to stop me. Okay, got it. Ask some questions. Checks into the hotel, says... Well, she calls ahead on oh, the 22nd, yeah, right. so about a week, and a little says over a week. And says another Fairgate is going to enter the building. Yes. Louis Fairgate, L-O-I-S. You're versus assuming Jennifer. it's a husband. Could be. Right? Could You're be. Assuming, but it could be like a family member. Um, but, I don't know, maybe just because I watch too many dramas, they could be saying or alluding to a husband, but side man. Side man? Yeah. Whoa. I mean, like, if you're going to have a side person, you're not going to be like, oh, I'm checking in right. such and such. You'd be like, oh, check it in. Someone use the same last name. Right. You're going to say John Doe uh, Fairgate. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for what it's worth, it is unknown what the original check-in date was. But we do know that they called and they updated it to be May 31st. So that is when they checked in. Again, 1044 p.m. The next day, the front desk staff noticed that the Fairgates in room 2805 had no credit card on file. They had not paid anything previously for the room, even for the initial check-in. The plaza is a luxury hotel, and at the time, it was probably one of the most famous, especially in that area. And this particular room, just for the detail of it all, cost... 1,845 kroner a night. Moving that up to today's dollars with inflation, that would be around 3,100 kroner or around 333 US dollars. Okay. $300 a night. I mean, it's not insane. Not insane. That could be like, hey, this is our one vacation, Mm -hmm. you know, and we want to get a nice hotel. I bet you that this 
this is just me speaking. Yeah. This hotel, among many others, have vastly outpaced inflation in their costs. So, I mean, today, like, that's what it is in inflation dollars, but I bet today it would cost a whole lot more. Yeah, that's true. Is my guess. But it is a luxury hotel, and it is worth mentioning, again, they usually, at check-in, I, I should say always, required payment or a credit card on file. So that's already a strange element here. On Thursday, June 1st, around 2.19 p.m., staff sent a message to the room that appeared on the television screen saying, quote, please contact the cashier. Someone in the room acknowledged the message by pressing OK on the remote, and that occurred 19 hours after that message was sent. Basically saying like, hey, front desk is here. Come on down to us. We realize there's no card on file. We need to talk to you. So that's wild. And so in the 90s, they had... Hotels have the technology to send a message to your TV Mm -hmm. and then also see if you've confirmed said message. Right. It feels very much like early TiVo. It's kind of like that early stage of pay-per-view. Yeah. yeah. So there is some tech involved and it's also a luxury hotel, so I'm not surprised. But yeah, mid nineties, that is an interesting piece of information that they could do. I didn't, you know, yeah, I was yeah, kind of yeah, I'm, a, I'm a tech junkie, so yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, they had that te- the whole yeah. confirm. Is I was using a TV guide that year, so yeah. that's me going, <laughs> yeah. whoa, they had that? Okay, so they sent a message, and, and I love that they have this because that means they can track the activity in this room in hindsight. But another message was sent on Friday, 8.57 p.m. This time, it was only eight minutes later that the message was acknowledged, but no one from room 2805 contacted hotel staff. So twice now, they've said, hey, come talk to the cashier here at the front desk. You know, we just need to chat with you. Acknowledged, no one comes down. The front desk staff actually asked the cleaning crew if anybody had entered the room at all after Thursday, which again was June 1st, uh, because After Thursday, there was a do not disturb sign put on the door, specifically Friday and Saturday. So, of course, nobody went in. So Yeah, do not disturb, we don't go in. Basically, the front desk is starting to go, like, something's odd here. We want to make sure that they're going to pay and not ghost us. Has has anyone seen anybody? Their concern is, like, hey, we don't have anything on file. Right. We don't, you know, they're not responsive. They're being kind of dodgy. Yeah. This isn't something that usually happens. Right. So, so far, this is a monetary concern. But then on Saturday, June 3rd, they sent yet another message at 7.36 p.m. And it was also acknowledged. But again, no call, no appearance. Nobody came down to the front desk. So the front desk staff decided to send a security guard to the room to figure out what was going on. At approximately 7.50 p.m., about 14 minutes later, security knocked on the door. And seconds later, he heard what sounded like a gunshot. The guard left the room without alerting any other staff and went straight to the security guard station in order to call the police. So he tells nobody else, goes straight to the phone, calls the police. I feel like you should at least alert the manager and be like, no one goes in that room. Well, or look at the cameras, lock down the doors, nobody gets out, nobody comes in. Let's like freeze this place till police can be here. You know? Yeah, that too. Also, I wouldn't want to raise I alarm, mean, but... The, when, when people have phones... I guess not yet, right? Yeah, I mean, is like, this still, is this still the time of like? It's true. I mean, I've seen those weird, in movies. What a weird That's it. Thing. You're just like, oh, I was. You had money if you had a car phone. Like, oh yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, I guess like beepers and pagers were still the time. This was still the time, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's too dangerous to say, hey, someone post up here. Right? Like, because then you potentially put someone else's life in danger because you heard a gunshot. The person could come out with the gun. True. And like, you, you can't, like, yeah. I don't know. That's a that's, sticky situation. That's so rough. Yeah. Like you, yeah. Like you're saying, you want to keep the situation contained and the, co- the possible, like, culprit, like, sealed in. Mm hmm. But you put people in danger. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Now we're at a point in the case where a minute by minute breakdown is essential because a lot can change in this scene very quickly. So 14 minutes after the acknowledgement of the latest message from the front desk, security guard goes up, knocks on the door, hears the gunshot, goes down, calls the police. 15 minutes later, he returns to the room, knocks on the door yet again to see, all right, is anybody in here? What's going on? What was that sound? No answer. This time, the guard decided to try to open the door, but was unable to do so because there was a deadbolt 
if you've not heard of what that is, it's basically yeah. a little chain that comes over. Yeah. Sometimes in a more modern hotel, you see like a little flap that a comes out. Flap. Basically just a way to double lock the door despite who might have the electronic key yeah. from getting in. It always so baffled me that a little flap did anything. Yeah. It just seemed like it's just a little flap, but you just just put on the side of the, the door that's opening. Yep. And it just stops the door. As long as you anchor it properly, kind of going into the door frame and into the wall, that thing is going to hold. Yeah, it's, it's wild to me. Oh, yeah. Now, what's interesting, he opened the door, there's a deadbolt, but he notices what he described as an acrid smell, or in other words, an irritatingly strong and foul smell. So the security guard had a special key that would open up essentially any door in the place, I imagine, like a skeleton key. Master key, key yes. Yeah, skeleton key that they call it. Yeah. That's what a, what a cool name for it. I love it. that. It's sinister in its own way, but makes sense. He's a security guard. But when looking through the door, he saw a woman lying down on the bed with her arms up, but the guard left the room in order to wait for police. Now, what's interesting regarding this scene is that there's a lot of different descriptions for how this woman was posed. Some say that she was sitting on the edge of the bed. Some say that she was lying down. Depends on what you're looking at, what source. But Christian and Jillian, in looking for the research and trying to get to the real answer, it does sound like she was lying down. But Christian, can you kind of mime for us how her hands were? Yeah. It, we'll describe. It was essentially, imagine that she was sitting on the edge of the bed and then fell backward and her arms were kind of curled up toward her her chest. Okay. I'd almost say, like, to, just to describe it for the listeners, almost like a boxing stance where you have your arms up to your chin, mm -hmm. except a little lower to the upper part of the chest, around the collarbone. It's a very good description. Almost like yeah. you're a football player grabbing your, you know, resting on your collar, Yeah, if you've seen that. Mm -hmm. And so that's how she was lying on the bed. Okay. Yeah. So kind her, of perpendicular to how you would sleep. Yeah, we don't know what part of the bed she was was oh, on, what whether edge it was from she was the foot on. of the bed or the edge of the bed. Got but yeah, it. it was like her her lower legs were hanging off the edge of the bed. Like she'd got been it. sitting up on the bed. And then her, fell back. Got, and got fell it. backward. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Another 30 minutes go by. So he sees this scene, he leaves, waits for police. Again, I can't Damn, what's the response time right now? Well, <laughs> so far, pretty long. No, well, not too bad, but for a gunshot, pretty long. Yeah. And I also can't emphasize them enough how important these minutes are because people can come and go and things can change, right? So after another 30 minutes, around 8.30 p.m., almost about 40 minutes after he heard the gunshot, police arrived and then entered the room. They found Jennifer Fairgate on the bed with a gunshot wound through her forehead and a Browning 9 millimeter pistol in her right hand on her chest. I actually have a photo of how she was holding the pistol. And if, in fact, I think it is her hand holding the pistol. Oh, wow. So she's holding it in her right hand with her thumb on the trigger, kind of what holding a, it in reverse. Oh, yeah. I guess if you're like pointing it towards you. So this looks like it was a suicide. Mm -hmm. The way she's holding it, because you're like, yeah, your thumb on the trigger. It's probably because you're, you're pulling it backwards towards you. Right. It looks like a rusty gun, like a beat up gun. Mm hmm. Um, but that could be dried blood, maybe. Oh, wow. Yeah. A lot will hinge on this detail in particular. Interesting. It definitely plays into exactly what your first inclination is, but we will come back to this idea in the follow-up yeah, investigation. Yeah, I doubt it's that simple. Yeah. So let's continue to describe the rest of the scene. So the TV was still on and the window was open. Basically that, hey, let's come talk to the cashier window, I believe. No one else was in the room and Louis Fairgate was nowhere to be found. Again, it's hard to know if anyone even saw this person. Right. I was, I was just about to say, we don't know if Louis Fairgate was a actual... Existed. Existed. Yeah. Uh, was it a per... Like, was it a, a male, a female? No one's really seen. They've kind of been locked away in this room. Right. So we know this person was mentioned because she called prior to her stay and said, hey, May 31st, Louis Fairgate will be there. A few eyewitnesses claim to have seen her in the lobby with a man that has not been verified, but those are eyewitness accounts. So that's all we have regarding this Louis Fairgate. And then less than 12 hours later at 5 a.m. on June 4th, police decided that the woman's death was a suicide. But police began to wonder if something more nefarious took place once they realized that they didn't know 
who this woman really was. In fact, we're going to talk about a lot of the things in the scene that add to some of the confusion and just raise questions to kind of shake up this otherwise clear-cut solution. In the room, there was very little luggage. There was a small turquoise suitcase and a black attache case, only containing 25 rounds of 9mm ammunition, nothing else. So a case just filled with bullets. Oh, wow. Why, why do you need that many bullets? Right. Why do you need that many bullets? That's a very good question, especially given what we know the police's conclusion to be. There was also no toiletries, no toothbrushes, no makeup, but there was a bottle of men's cologne that was almost empty. So it implies that either she preferred l'eau de homme or that there was a man in the scene. We don't know. Now, it's worth mentioning that a passport is required to enter Norway, as you can imagine, and some form of identification is required to check in at the hotel, which makes it even stranger that there was no wallet and no passport. There's no identification on this person or in the room whatsoever. I mean, are we sure that they flew in? We're not entirely sure that, th that they flew in because we don't know exactly who they are. Yeah. But the fact that there was no identification in the room just kind of makes investigators wonder, like, how did they get here? Yeah. How did they check in with that, no that, payment and no right. identification? That aspect, I, I think, is like a big thing. But, I mean, who's to say they weren't, like, native? That's true. That's true. Now, to add to this confusing scene, both key cards that were used to open this room, because every room is given two key cards, just redundancy or for the two guests, whatever, yeah. they were left on the table nearby the half-eaten room service that you also have a photo of. So, again, it doesn't seem to indicate that anyone went in or out. I mean, I guess you could leave the room with the keys inside. You just wouldn't be able to return. True. So, I mean, with the plate of, like, eaten food, mm -hmm. I mean, couldn't they have done a DNA test? So DNA testing did exist at the time, but it was still fairly new because this was in 95, and the first uh, recorded use of DNA testing in a, a criminal investigation was in 86. So, okay. Oh, well, so that's yeah, even uh, very new technology. So, so I don't know. It, it existed, but not widely used. Like yeah. IMAX cameras, right? Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> There's only got four of these in the world. And right. then Christopher Nolan breaks one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. I, okay. So that's earlier than I expected. I knew that late 90s is when it really starts to come yeah. into play. But that's where but, I yeah, think like you're... 86 is when that's it was actually early. used. Well, I was earlier. But I also think the question about your... DNA library comes into play, but also like new technique. Are people thinking to do that? I don't know. But there are, there's going to be a few frustrating turns in this case that make you go, oh, come on. Oh, no. Mishandling of yes. evidence so, or something. You know, so I, earlier I had the thought when you were talking about how like the security guard yeah. looked inside and then was like, okay, I'm going to wait. And I was like, smart. Don't tamper with evidence. Yada, uh -huh. yada, yada. I was like, sweet. I'm, I'm, we're good here. And then here it comes. There's, there's the other. The other, the other shoe drops where someone messed up somewhere. Yeah. Let's continue to build the crime scene and then I'll get you with that frustration. So there was a used towel in the bathroom, so it appeared that she had showered at some point. Almost all the woman's clothes had the tags removed. And speaking of the clothing, the stuff left behind was odd. So just like no tags on the shirt, stuff like that? Yeah. Everything had the tags removed except for one piece. And I'll get to that as oh. to maybe why. But the other clothes left behind were odd. There's one blouse, one pair of shoes, and one sweater. But then there were four bras and four different jackets. Doesn't really line up. Now, she was wearing the blouse, the only pair of stockings, and shorts that some have described as underwear, but locals have described as kind of pajama shorts because they were silk undershorts. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, got, I got a pair of shorts like that where it's like, look, I, could, right I could go out in them, but... I don't know. Depends on the neighborhood. Yeah. You know what I mean, like, you don't want to be walking around a family neighborhood with these shorts. I'm just, you know. Fair enough. The workout shorts, you right. know, you wear at home, nice and comfy. Right. But then you like, go out, it but becomes yeah, a crime. When you go to walk the dog, <laughs> when you walk, yeah, when you go to walk the dogs, yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> when you go to walk the dogs, yeah, I stop at the door and I go, ah, I should change. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me when I was a kid, uh, I got these really cool Batman boxers, but I didn't know the concept of boxers because I was a briefs boy. Mm. And so, like, I put on my briefs, then I put on the boxers, and I'm like, I got my Batman shorts on. <laughs> and I went to pre K. I got double underwear. That's basically shorts. And so, I went to pre K that day and, and some kid was like in that underwear and I'm like no nah, dude these are the cool oh you actually cool went shorts. to school well not school but pre K well yeah mm -hmm. so there were kids there 
Wait, your parents didn't check you at the door? I mean, who's to say I didn't sneak into the car? You know? <laughs> right, right. Smuggle myself under they a jacket. Never, they never looked back. They never looked, back. I'll they tell never you though, looked at me when they dropped me off. They didn't, they didn't let me do it again. There's so like, they found out. There, yeah, but it was like. I was like, these are my cool shorts. There's like five security checks from your parents. That should have happened. Yeah. <laughs> this man snuck through parent TSA. Right, right. <laughs> Maybe I had a third pair of briefs over top of it all. <laughs> yeah. And so they said change and I just whipped those off <laughs> and they had no idea. All right. But yeah, basically it's silk undershorts, however you want to describe those. There were no other underwear in the room, no pants and no skirt. She was wearing a gold ring and a Citizen Aqualand diving watch. Only one jacket had its tag intact that I mentioned before. And that may be because it would have ruined the lining if it were removed. So many uh, shirts yeah, have the yeah. danging tag, yeah. dangling. This jacket, like if you pulled it out, was stitched on all the sides, basically into the liner. Right. So to take it out, you would have either, either needed one of those kind of de-threaders yeah. or it might have left Which is annoying because usually those are just the, the, the end points. So those are a little itchy. Mm -hmm. Or it's just they have like a, little, rough. They're like a little rough. Yeah. I, I mean, okay, so the thing is... I can see how it's like, I don't know, is that, a, uh, you know, is that a little like mysterious crime piece or whatever? I think it's just someone that doesn't like tags, and I get that. I rip out every tag I get. I, every tag I'm You can I'm call me the out. Joker, but I, ro I rip right. out every tag yeah. I get. I mean, I don't have tags on my clothes because it's just, it's annoying. Mm -hmm. Because like, even if there were tags on these pieces of clothing, they'd have to be very like niche pieces of clothing to leave a trail right to anyone right like i can't have a i could be at a crime scene and have a whole set of old navy clothes and no one's gonna like that's not gonna lead back to perhaps. anything most likely perhaps i mean when you have big box stores most likely not but what's interesting about this jacket is that it was from rene lazard i say that in a french way but it's actually a fashion designer from germany and so now they kind of get an indication maybe this person is traveling abroad. Whether they're local or not is still yet to be determined, but it does give them a sense that like maybe there should be a passport in play because mm. she's traveling around. That wouldn't, I, in my opinion, that doesn't hold up in modern day because you, you, you order true. everything online and get shipped everywhere. You got Etsy. Absolutely. Person, you know I mean? Absolutely. Like, it's a great uh, point. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but I mean, yeah, sure. Back then, it's like, okay, well, how did you obtain said thing? Right, and, and I mean, to your point, she could have easily gone down the street to a box store and still picked up a fashion design yeah, from that's anywhere. True. I mean, you're, it's a great point. What's interesting is that all the clothing was either black or gray, and I think this might play into one of the theories. Now, both the bags in the room appeared to be too small to hold even this amount of clothing, so a lot of things are not lining up. Some things mm. seems missing from the scene. Some things seem extraneous to the scene. Yeah, it's it's strange. I think the amount of clothing is is really weird, and the different pieces of like the ratios depending on what they are. Like undergarments, do you think there'd be an abundance of that as opposed sure. to like four jackets or something like that? Right. Um, and maybe it's just me traveling or whatever. But and yeah, I mean, you guys, you know, it's a, an investigation. You got to look at every single piece. But you know, to me, that's just like someone that's underpacked that went to like Japan. You know what I mean? Like the number sure. like Japan it's like the big thing there. It's like, look, bring an empty uh suitcase yeah. cuz you're going to pack it full of all kinds of stuff that you buy there. Right. Um, she's like uh, jackets are expensive, hard to get the right fit, bras especially. So yeah. she's like, I'm going to bring those and I'll buy everything else. Yeah, buy everything else. It could be. Or Again, if you go with the immediate um, kind of conclusion that the police had, if this was a planned suicide, would you really be packing for the future? I, you know, that's yeah. something else to be considering. Of. That's true. Yeah. But why bring four jackets then? And why bring uh, 25 plus rounds of ammunition? That's very true. Right. Going back to that. Let me, let me, <laughs> look, maybe a couple rounds, right? Mm -hmm. Is what you need. Like no one, like 25 rounds, I don't think like, you know. I think you're still kind of on the side of like, I'm going to live type right. thing. Like, yeah, 25 rounds is, that's so much. And those are just loose tumbling in the attache case. Yeah, that's true. They're not even like in a box or anything like yeah. that. Also, like, how do you, I guess they'd have to be purchased locally, right? Yeah, I don't know if you Cause like. you can't. You can't travel with that? You can't. No, you can't travel with that's that. That's before TSA. You can't. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Oh, that's true. I mean, you can't check in ammunition. Right. Like, like you just can't. Ma'am, could you shake that case and just make sure? 
Yeah, that sounds like clothes. Next. Yeah. Rattle, rattle. Yeah. Hmm. It's, well, no, I'm not taking it on with me. It's going to be right. in the cargo bay of the of the. Yeah, of the I mean, either way. So it, I guess that has to be purchased locally. It, yeah, could be. Now, let's just talk about that gun for a second, because, again, it was at the crime scene. She's holding it backwards with her thumb on the trigger. It still had seven bullets in the magazine, and it was discovered that another bullet had been shot into the pillow on the bed. So we only have one gunshot that was heard. It's not to say that other shots weren't made, but there is a bullet hole on the pillow kind of off to the side of the body. The identification number on the gun had been removed with acid, which is very interesting. So now police kind of turn to the hotel to look at the forms and the documentation that they have. Obviously, they don't have identification. They don't have a form of payment, but they have something on file. And so they look at the documents and they see the name, the address, and the company that she gave were all fake. The address pointed to Verlaine, Belgium, though the street name was fake. And so maybe that's why we have the passport in play. Verlaine is a small village, and we couldn't find the population in the mid-90s, but as of 2006, the population was about 3,000. I think oh, today... very tiny. Very tiny. And today, it's about 4,200. And so you can maybe extrapolate, like, somewhere between, like, in the mid-2000s of population yeah. in the mid-90s. Now, under the company name, she wrote Service, but no company exists in Belgium with that name. And when I asked Jillian, I was like... Is there any company anywhere that has that name? She could only find one kind of bespoke company in Australia. Mm. This individual signed her name as Fergate, not as Fairgate, as we kind of know her to be. And it was just a different spelling of a similar name. And after an autopsy, coroners found that her age to be around 30 years old, give or take. But on the documents, she had put her age as 21 when she signed into the hotel. Yeah, there's... I mean, there's nothing stopping you today from putting in, like, right, like a fake address or fake name. I guess, like, they check your ID and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then they'll, so that that's the check there. But I don't know. It's not a bar. They're not really going to be checking IDs that intensely. Like, right. You have a fake ID made and then, boom, you just whatever name and address you want. That's very true. You can sign in with a fake name, do whatever you want. But what's interesting is that Radisson requires a passport number of their guests. And they also have to provide, as I've said a few times now, a credit card number. And so this whole case kind of comes back to the idea that she checked in somehow with neither of those things. And then when looking in her room, again, neither of those assets are there. So how did she get into the room? How did she check in? Who allowed this? And who really yeah, is that's she? That's the thing too, right? Because even if they were to swipe a card from a guest or from the desk or something mm -hmm. like that, like if you swiped it from a guest and you have issues because you're double booked in that room at that point, if you swipe it from the desk, like, and they don't know, then I guess the room is still read as unoccupied. So they might accidentally book. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. how did you swipe the keys, get in without anybody knowing, and yet you're still checked in? Right. Essentially. The like, only... that's, that's the weird part. Oh, yeah. And then you start looking at, like, the hotel and the employees. Is there a connection there? Because that's just the easiest answer, right? Someone on the inside helped them, like, check in without all these credentials and... Uh, proof of right. payment, whatnot. Right. Put I them mean, into the system. The ongoing theory is that maybe she checked in at such a busy time that they were just like, eh, let's just move through this. Or maybe this was a new employee. But regardless of that, I feel like it doesn't matter how busy you are, you will wait. I've had to wait before. Yeah. It's like it's a luxury hotel. You can't just kind of like flippantly let people through. Again, I want to earmark this little piece too because it could be resolved by the second theory we're going to discuss. Okay. But we'll get there. So in the end, kind of wrapping up the evidence piece here, no family members could be identified and no one reported this unknown woman as missing. You would think that if somebody passes away, suddenly that someone somewhere would start saying, hey, I'm missing somebody. Regarding her physical description, she had short dark hair and was about 159 centimeters tall or five foot two. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. The end of year season always stirs up a mix of emotions, doesn't it, boys? Yes, it does. Closing the door on yet another year. Holidays coming. Happy times. But you think about always all the things. Always looking back on the year. Always looking back mm -hmm. on the year. Yeah. Time mm -hmm. went fast. 
They can be fun, but they can also be stressful as you're prepping with your family and your loved ones for travel and other things. You know, there's a, there's a lot of sadness sometimes this time of year. Hey, let me tell you, that's where therapy comes in. It's like a little beacon of light amid all the chaos that can help you develop the tools to navigate the roller coaster of the season. If you're thinking about starting therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. And the best part is it's entirely online. They make it super convenient. I love that part. It's flexible. It's tailored specifically to your schedule and your needs. You fill out a quick questionnaire and they will match you with a licensed therapist. And uh, you can switch anytime. If you're not lining up with that therapist, there is zero charge for that. I really appreciate how easy they make the entrance into therapy. Looking back, there's many times where I've needed the service, I've needed help, and I love, again, how accessible it is. I go online, I answer the questionnaire, they find out exactly what I'm needing, and they can find a person. And the biggest part for me is that you need to find the right person. You're not going to hit it right out the gate all the time. One, two, maybe sometimes three people go by, and then you land on somebody that just understands you, and they make that part super easy. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash redweb today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash redweb. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Rocket Money. You ever feel like your subscriptions are taking over your life? If you need help, then look no further than Rocket Money because I know we do. Rocket Money is your personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills. Okay, all in one place. Love it. But it isn't your ordinary personal finance app. It's your sidekick in the battle against sneaky subscriptions, your guardian of spending, and your trusty bill negotiator all rolled into one. Fredo, we've both used this. I know it's good. Tell me about your experience with it. Well, my experience lately is that you talk about sneaky subscriptions. Uh -huh. All these subscriptions for like movie and TV show mm -hmm. apps are Making jumps in prices. Big jumps. And, and so all of them. They're all all, yeah. all do, across the board. Sometimes sneaky and, too. And so like it's it's nice to see that like, oh, okay, I'm paying more for, for this than I previously was. So like it's it's nice to just have a place to go to see all the subscriptions, see how expensive they all are, and start making choices. Absolutely. With over 5 million users and counting, Rocket Money has helped save its customers, including us, an average of $720 a year and $1 billion in total savings so far. That's a lot of money saved. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash redweb. That's rocketmoney.com slash redweb. And one more time, rocketmoney.com slash redweb. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot of bring bring. Man, Shopify helps you do your thing. However you cha-ching. You guys like that? Oh, man, it's a sound effect. Boy. <laughs> I've got my own buttons and they're right here in my vocal cords. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits. I like that. Red Web soap. Write that down, Christian. Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. And you can sell more with less efforts thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify's the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Linen, just to name a few. But millions of other entrepreneurs of all different shapes and sizes have used Shopify across 175 countries. We here at Red Web actually use Shopify to power our e-commerce store. If you're interested, you can go take a look at what it looks like and how easy it is to browse. It's been so easy to upload photos and merchandise to it and also apply sales if that's your thing. But you can go to store.roosterteeth.com to take a look. That is a Shopify store. And I love it. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash redweb, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash redweb now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in, shopify.com slash redweb, and you can get these kind of luminous sound effects on your shop. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by First Leaf. Being in the grocery store during the holidays can be pretty stressful, and the wine aisle is one of the most overwhelming spots, but First Leaf takes all the stress of finding that new wine out of the equation. First Leaf is the wine club that sends you a personalized shipment of bottles that are based on your unique palate. 
Just go to their website, answer a few questions about your likes and dislikes, and you'll receive world-class wines based on your answers. All First Leaf wine is priced 30% lower than what you would pay at the wine store, and every selection is backed by First Leaf's 100% satisfaction guarantee, which is huge because you don't want to walk home with a bottle of wine and go, oh, I don't like this. I used their website, and the questionnaire was so simple. It asked me what kind of flavor profiles I like. Do I like floral, fruity, nutty, earthy? Do I like dry? Do I like sweet? Do I like red? Do I like white? It was super quick, but also very thorough, and in about... 30 seconds, I had a broad selection of wines that they were going to send me. And so I didn't even have to think about it. And I love the fact that it's all guaranteed. So if you don't like a bottle, send it back. They'll set you up with an even better one. Find the wine you'll love this holiday season with First Leaf. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash redweb to sign up and you'll get your first six hand curated bottles for just $44.95. That's a bargain. That's T R Y F I R S T. L-E-A-F dot com slash red web. Try firstleaf.com slash red web. With that said, let's dive into the initial investigation from the police before then getting into the 2015 investigation. So unfortunately, there were no security cameras in the hallways of the hotel, so they could not use those to check her movement, which would simplify this case drastically. That said, there are no records of police checking any of the other cameras in the hotel frustrating. Additionally, just to add the frustration, this is what I was teasing before, the bedding was thrown out hours after finding the body in the hotel. So no DNA could be found on these sheets. Man, that's like, I don't know. It's like one of the top five things you bag. Oh yeah. It's a cornerstone to these unsolved mysteries is that there's a mishandling of evidence. Yeah. Or an I ignorance realize to the situation. that on this damn show. Mm-hmm. It's just like, <laughs> you know, or even just lost in transit stuff. I'm like, what? Right. People's heads gone missing. Yeah. yeah. Body parts go yeah. missing in transit. Someone's got that in their collection somewhere. You know that. And they don't know. They just got a skull somewhere. And I'm like, that's from a crime. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. They did take fingerprints and they ran those by Interpol and found not a single match on those fingerprints. Police interviewed any hotel staff that may have seen or spoken to Fairgate to try to get as much as possible. The hotel staff described her as fashionable and elegant and said that she was fluent in both English and German. On Thursday, June 1st, the day after she checked in, hotel staff cleaned the room around 1 p.m. So this goes back to the idea that she eventually put up the Do Not Disturb, but they had been in there on Thursday. But neither Fairgate nor her companion were in the room at that time. Key card records show, I love this part, key card records show that the door had been opened at 8.34 a.m., so Fairgate left sometime between then and 1 p.m. when the cleaning staff had arrived. So they can kind of track the goings in and out of yeah. this place. The door had not been opened again until 8.50 a.m. the next day on Friday, June 2nd. There was no record of an entrance to the room around the time of her death. The night before she died, on Friday, June 2nd, at about 8.06 p.m., Fairgate ordered room service, bratwurst, and a potato salad. The staff member who delivered it said that Fairgate's room looked very clean and almost untouched, basically since the cleaning service the day before. She gave a large tip at the time of 50 kroner, or about $8. Food was found undigested in her autopsy, indicating that she must have eaten it much later after the delivery of the food or sometime just before her death. This is also the last confirmed time that the door was opened with her key card. On June 2nd, the same day, the Plaza woman visited the front desk sometime between 8.30 and 11 a.m. and requested to extend her stay until Sunday, June 4th. This is the only time that we know that she went down to the front desk. And th- what blew me away, and I had to ask Jillian, is if they kept asking her to come to the front desk, why did no one flag this moment? Why did no one then ask for... That's what I'm saying proof of purchase or oh, a credit card hey, or anything. You're in that room that's been causing a little bit of issues she, for us. Because the next day she got another message saying, hey, come to the front desk. She had been there by at this point. Uh, but we have no indication as to why, why no, they missed that. Why did no one check her at the desk? Right, right. It's all, like if we didn't have a body or people who have actually talked and seen this person, it's almost like this person didn't exist the way right. we were moving around. I want you to hold on to that. Again, I keep teasing this this one theory in particular. Oh, damn. <laughs> and I'm curious. I'm curious. So in the end, no one had reported that the Plaza woman had been missing. 
No one knew her, it seems. No one reported this this person. Preventing police from finding any family or friend connections and making it so they could not identify this woman properly. Police kept the body for a year in case anyone came forward, but no one ever did. And she was subsequently buried on June 26, 1996 in an unmarked grave. She became known as the Oslo Plaza woman, though some still refer to her and the case as the name that she gave, Jennifer Fairgate. And that's where the case would have left until Lars Christian Wegner reported on the Plaza woman's funeral in a series of articles on missing persons, which was about 20 years later. And the reason why, and I'll, I'm jumping ahead of myself in my own notes, but the reason why this took 20 years is because he kind of asked for more information to identify this person, to get into this case, but it took police a long time to kind of give permission for him to have access to this information. Mm. They didn't agree until 2015, though we don't really know why there was a delay. It right. could be sensitivity, it could just be bureaucracy. Either way, it took 20 years. He remained interested in this case for the entire 20 years, which is fascinating. It and I, a lot I of willpower. Gotta love an investigator that doesn't give up. So here we are. He had a VG artist create a new sketch of the Plaza woman based on descriptions. He created then a timeline and noticed that based on when the cleaning crew had visited in the room on that Thursday around 1 p.m. and the Plaza woman's key card history, she must have been out of the room for over 20 hours from at least 1 p.m. until 8 a.m. on that next morning on Friday. Wegner interviewed the room service staff member. She recalled seeing a rolling suitcase in the room and that she was wearing a skirt. Neither of those two items were present when we discussed the scene of the crime. Oh. The skirt was not on her person anymore, nor in the room, and the rolling case was absolutely absent. The rolling suitcase led that staff member who delivered the food to believe that the Plaza woman must be like a flight attendant or something like that. But again, these things were missing when the police arrived. Wegner also interviewed the employee who had cleaned up the room while the Plaza woman was out. This employee remembered another pair of shoes that weren't present after her death. Wild that this is 20 years the later. 20 years later, we're still getting like these little tidbits that I feel like should have been just, I don't know, laid out on the table. Oh yeah. During the time. Absolutely. In fact, Unsolved Mysteries covered this particular case. They had dramatizations of how the scene looked and everything. And actually in that episode about the case, Wegner was able to visit Verlaine in Belgium, the city that we talked about before. And he asked around if people knew the Plaza woman, but no one did. He verified the street was actually real, not fake, as was previously thought to be made up, and the telephone numbers were accurate, but Wegner could not determine her connection to this small village. Then on November 16th, 2016, a little over a full year later, Wegner was able to get the Plaza woman's body exhumed to get a full DNA profile on this woman. Despite Whoa. this, oh yeah. However, no matches were found. To this day, Wegner is still searching for answers, which leads us to three very popular theories that attempt to resolve this case. I mean, honestly, it does just feel like a clean cut suicide case mm -hmm. as of right now. Yeah. Light packing. I mean, the food, that's another big thing too, right? Like, or the food, because it's probably like, I'm hungry or I should eat and just sitting there with their thoughts for hours and hours have passed by and then it's like okay well i'm gonna eat something and then they finally committed the action because there was food in their system damn yeah i don't know it just kind of feels like that and yeah i feel like uh i don't know i just feel like the possible other person the possible significant other is just made up could be absolutely could, could be to, to lay the scene in a way that is expected, a normal scene. Yeah. So let's talk about that theory first. The okay. idea that that is how the case is, that it was a case of suicide. And that is Occam's razor, right? Or the theory that takes the least amount of assumptions to get to is that she ended her own life. That is what the police determined upon their investigation. She must not have wanted anyone to find her. And sadly, it appears that no one ever did want to find her. No one ever did figure out who she really was. Police believe that Lewis Fairgate never existed, which is exactly kind of your indication as well. Though some staff members did claim, as I mentioned before, that they saw her walking through the lobby with a man. To be determined who that person is, but some sort of masculine figure. 
Evidence pointed toward this conclusion, including the door being double locked with that deadbolt from the inside. There was no balcony on this 28th floor. Although the window was open, it doesn't seem like there's any possible realistic way to get right, in and out. Yeah. Uh, 28 floors up, right? Both the key cards remained in the room after the Plaza woman's death. And so that once again indicates no one came in and out either during the crime or after the, the incident. Police believed that since there were so few records of entering the room, she likely sat in the room for days preparing for her death. Historically, it's fairly uncommon for women to end their own lives with a firearm, but it's not totally unheard of. According to Wegner, only about one and a half percent of women who ended their lives in Norway used a firearm, and this study was done between the years 2000 and 2009. So it's unlikely, but not unheard of. The hiding of her identity and seemingly missing clothes has led many to suspect that the Plaza woman was involved with some kind of foul play. That is really the wrinkle in this theory. Not only, like, packing light, I think we can understand, especially given this theory and the circumstances, but if there are things missing from the scene, that's where things start to get a little confusing. Where would they have gone and why? Did they go out with the trash? Was it something where she went out, changed clothes, came back? It's really yeah. hard to say. With the idea of foul play in mind, there was no evidence of a struggle. On top of the missing clothes, the presence of 34 9mm rounds in total seems a bit overkill for the purposes of this particular theory. In fact, one of the biggest wrinkles to me comes down to the weapon. And now I am no expert by any means regarding firearms, but this is kind of Wegner's indication knowing about the browning that was used. It supposedly has a hard recoil. I mention this because it makes it unlikely that she could hold the weapon the way she was right. found holding it without it either having left her hand or a, like kind of changed in some way. It seems like given the way the scene was found that the the act was committed and that she just like gently fell back. It was gently fell back and everything kind of just fell into place on her body with the, you know, in regards to her arms. Right. And, but yeah, I mean, if the weapon had a lot of kickback, the the arm, especially the arm holding the firearm itself, would essentially, sh the force would swing it out, right? Right. And then at that point, the arm would be laid out, extended mm -hmm. in some way, not gently laid upon her chest. Right. The, I mean, that's a, a great point, too. Yeah. Especially, huh. um... Dang, that's a very important piece of information. Yeah. And on top of that, I know you were looking at the image, you, you noticed that there might be some sort of rust or buildup on the weapon, and that it could be, I think you mentioned gunpowder, that is actually addressed. So according to chief pathologist at Oslo University, the fact that she had no blood splatters on her hands or clothes was also very unusual. So not only do we have a recoil situation with the placement of the arms, but he told Unsolved Mysteries that usually someone ending their own life Wait, usually uses yeah. both hands because they're, they're shaking, they're nervous. Yeah. But in addition to that, not only the recoil itself comes into play, it changes the position of the hands, but it also creates blood splatters to the immediate extremities. And the fact that her hands had no residue of, of blood or yeah, anything I mean, like that. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. So those are the biggest wrinkles to the idea of a suicide in this moment. I mean, those are huge wrinkles. Pretty big wrinkles. Like, and I'm gonna get there to should it, be blood on the hands. You would think, right? And I'm going to get to it later here in a second, but but also, my I just can't help but want to mention it because we also have the gunshot in the pillow. Why is that there? What happened with that? There's a lot of kind of ways you can take that, but it also, I don't know. We'll, we'll get to that. But it, I guess there's only one gunshot that was heard. One gunshot that was heard from huh. a guy right outside the door. So yeah. it's possible, you know. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll simmer on that because we're going to continue to unfurl some of these inconsistencies in the next theory. And this is the one I was very excited to get to because it's got the most intrigue. It's a little bit more fantastic. It obviously takes a few more leaps in logic, but it does still fit a little bit. So many people believe that the Plaza woman was actually a secret agent and that she may have been assassinated. It was common for agents to remove tags from clothes, and that may have been why she was not able to be identified, or maybe why she didn't want to be identified. It's also interesting that at that time, in the 90s, Oslo was a common meeting place for spies. There would be secret meetings between different nations that would often take place here at the Oslo Plaza, not just in the city, but here at this hotel. Whoa. Right. Many countries would come here because Oslo kind of became a safe haven for these types of meetings, for 
whatever reason, whether it be laws or them turning the other way or them just not kind of being privy to these conversations. It's yeah. just, it just kind of became a spot. Now, to further the point we kind of just made in the last theory, during the autopsy, the coroner pointed out that there was no back splatter of blood on the plaza woman's hands, but she also added that there was no gunshot residue on her hands. Well, that's big, right? Mm -hmm. Because there would be. Maybe somehow, some way, she found a way, I don't know, I mean, maybe with, this is kind of vivid, but like the barrel in your mouth with your lips close around that it could have it. blocked maybe it, you exhaust know I mean? or something yeah in, in, in terms of just like even just like the blood splatter mm. but the know. wound was through the forehead ah that's right yeah oh man you're right it was through the forehead uh i don't know how there's not gun residue on the hand right oh yeah like those are kind of things that like happen it's just so hard to avoid. And just for people, again, I'm not super how, familiar, yeah. but for those unfamiliar with firearms, when you pull the trigger, a hammer hits the, the, the bullet, which yep. explodes gunpowder, sends the bullet, uh, leaving some of the casing behind, right? And then like there is an exhaust from that explosion. Some of it sends the bullet out and some of it kind of leaves out and around where your hand is. So invariably, some of that residual gunpowder burning would land on your hand. Some older weapons would actually burn you in certain cases. But like, yeah, you would expect something. Yeah, you get some amount of gunpowder residue. And this isn't like, I mean, sure, maybe now today you have weapons that don't do that as much. Um, but I don't know, not during the 90s. That's something that's like... Well, they like, would know that this what this weapon is. and they Yeah, could exactly. Test, They'd you know? be like, well, this is a, a weapon that leaves gunpowder residue. Mm -hmm. It would also, you know, the gunpowder residue coming from, uh, coming onto the hands, but... You know, if the shot was made at such a close distance to the target, you would likely see gunpowder residue on the the sight of the, the that is bullet a great as well point. coming out of the barrel. That is a great and that point. wasn't noticed on her forehead. Which indicates a sort of distance mm -hmm. between the person and what would have been the weapon. That's a, I that's a great point, Christian. So to kind of speak on this, Ola Koldegger who was the former head of the Norwegian Intelligence Service Unit, E-14. This was a unit that was tasked with covert missions abroad. Well, he told Unsolved Mysteries a few things of note. Quote, I have a feeling that she was executed. The registration number was removed from the weapon. Marks were taken away from clothing. That's normal procedure in the intelligence service. End quote. He also said that the professional intelligence agent would know how deep to go when removing a weapon's registration number because they are carved quite deeply into the weapon themselves, or etched. He also told Wegner, the journalist, quote, Norway, Sweden, and Austria were typical safe havens where intelligence services could hold meetings and work in peace. They were open, benign, and naive countries, easy to travel to with good infrastructure and little police control. A lot probably happened that the public never heard about, end quote. So to Koldegger, the Plaza woman being out and about makes a lot of sense, as an agent would probably have other places to go and that the hotel would just be kind of a base of operations. Yeah. He also mentioned that the locked door having a deadbolt on it would be meaningless to any agent of sufficient skill. Like they would be able to unlock it and relock it from the outside. That is something that they would be well equipped to handle. Here's the thing too. There's just for people that, you know, commit suicide with a fire. There's absolutely no need to scratch off the serial number. Like, for what reason? You know, most likely you purchased the firearm, or even if it's like, I got the firearm for my family member or whatever, it doesn't mean that they're the one that committed the crime, mm -hmm. etc. So that's like, that's a much deeper level of importance. Damn. Yeah. Damn. Definitely trying to, there's, there's a lot of obfuscating the tracks, right? with preventing people from finding out who you are to preventing the weapon from being traced. And again, I was kind of teasing this thought, but if this person was a secret agent, did they know somebody at the Oslo Plaza that would enable them to get a room without needing a credit card or identification? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then normal employees are going, hold on a second, this is this is abnormal. And they're looking at their it system. Like, we need to it covers that portion. Right. But a manager who knows, right, you pass the gold coin, the John Wick style, and he yeah. goes, I'll get you your room at the Continental. It's it's totally possible. Yeah. Though it could feel fantastic. I mean, how else would somebody break such vivid protocol that no one gets a room without a credit card or a passport? That's just not how this luxury hotel operates. So it's interesting. 
Many believe that the Plaza woman was killed by another agent, possibly this Louis Fairgate figure. She may have been killed before the security guard even heard the gunshot, and the killer acknowledged the messages on the TV before they left. She could have been drugged, is another angle, as according to Wagner, the toxicology report showed that the pathologist only tested for alcohol, which is wild to me. They never tested for any other toxins, just to see if she was inebriated. Interestingly, the cleaning crew noticed that there was only one duvet on the bed at the time of the cleaning, but there were two on the bed when the Plaza woman's body was found. So where this other duvet come from? Why was it there? Was it from another room? All questions that will perhaps never be answered. Yeah. Officially, it's unknown how the killer would have escaped the room, right? We do have Kuldegger basically saying a, an agent with sufficient skill, you know, a certain set of skills could get in and out and that would be no problem to them. So there is that. But you also have the window being open. It's on the 28th floor. Was there rappelling in play? I mean, we have 40 minutes before the police show up, 15 minutes before the security guard enters the room or looks into the room. It's, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, what was the time between gunshot and someone getting to the door? So the security guard was at the door. Then the gunshot went off. And then... Oh, that's true. At that it point... Went off when he was at the door. So to answer your question, it was about 15 minutes before he attempted to go in the room. Because at 7.50 p.m. that night, he heard the gunshot, immediately went back to the security room to call police, came back, then opened the door 15 minutes later, noticed it was deadbolted, saw the woman, had the smell... An acrid smell in 15 minutes, though, right? That that yeah. foul smell in 15 minutes? Hmm. Is this That's, a body that was sitting cold, and I when someone so. knocked, there was a bang, set the scene, get the out. The thing is the bang. Right. That's, that's the thing. Well, I guess, like, the body was already dead. <gasps> right? Security's there. Right. It's like, well, security's going to come in. Right. They're going to see the body. Right. If I let off a gunshot, then security's probably going to scramble. Mm-hmm. So I think the gunshot that the security guard heard was a distraction, and Farragate was already dead. That is entirely possible, and you know what? That brings me back to the pillow. Was this a second shot? She had been dead for a while. Yeah. The acrid smell. Someone is staying there, clicking OK on the screen to make sure that it looks like she's still active and acknowledging these things, but no one comes down to the front desk because there's no one alive to do so. And when someone knocks on the door, they're like, I need to set the scene. I need to make this look like a suicide. Shoots the pillow because they got to shoot somewhere, I guess. And then that's why there's a bullet hole in the pillow. Another answer, and this could answer, and this is just something, I mean, this is out of movies. I admit this, but my brain also started thinking if this is an assassination attempt, is the pillow an attempt to stifle the shot and maybe also right. why there's less gunpowder residue on the body because the, the pillow was in play? That could answer also why there's a bullet hole in the pillow, but it doesn't answer why there's such a vivid, foul smell minutes after the shot. And the body had to have been the oh, decomposing man. by then. The yeah. usage of the word acrid here is a bit tricky because... It's such a subjective term. It's just true. an unpleasant smell. Like right. one could say gunpowder is has an acrid smell. That's very true. And it has a very distinct smell too. Yeah. And as for the the pillow, uh, something we did try to see if there was any information on was if there were uh, like shell casings or bullet fragments, anything that could signify there were two shots fired mm -hmm. and we couldn't find anything. So okay. the only proof we have of a, of a shot being fired was the one that Got the guard it. heard. We don't know for sure if there were more. I wish Wegner had the ability to talk to this particular security guard because we yeah. keep saying acrid because that is what they said. I wish they were a little bit more um, simple with it. You know, they broke out the thesaurus for this one. And I'm like, just just tell us what you smelled. Because you're right. That is a that's a big part as to was this theory one or theory two. Now, I'm curious, Christian, if you could help me look up what is the magazine size of a standard Browning nine millimeter pistol? It depends on the magazine. The mm -hmm. lowest capacity is 10, but okay. it can go up to... I actually pulled it up because I knew this was going to be... Yeah. Happen. Well, 10 being the minimum is enough for me because there's seven bullets left, and we know one had been shot, but then upwards of two more. Was it fully loaded at any point? Yeah. Was it loaded with eight? Was it loaded with nine? Okay. We have an unsolved mystery on our hands, so we're not going to get these answers right, that we want. Exactly. But, but I feel like... Uh, dude, this is so close. This does feel like um, an assassination. For sure. 
Yeah, it fits. It, it fits really well. Um, and those fifteen Even regardless minutes, regardless of uh, like the hotel and and yeah. you know like. The laws here, et cetera, are like, you know, known to have a lot of play with like shadow figures and all that kind of stuff. Like, uh, I mean, this could just be just a straight up assassination. Yeah. And we'll say with the pillow too, just to, to speak on it in case it comes up, you know, with your, your idea of it being used to kind of suppress the shot, it is, you know, possible, but it would still be a very clearly audible gunshot. A hundred percent. Like that's... It is not going to clear it out. It's just going to yeah. get rid of some of the muzzle flare, which is some of the explosive sound. It is not a silencer, which yeah. even then, a silenced pistol is still a, loud. A, a silenced pistol is still very loud. It's not yeah. like the movies it where it's not like... Make the <laughs> It's not like, like no that way. at all. It's a great whatsoever. point. And on top of that, I do want to say this doesn't immediately wipe out theory number one because another idea is that perhaps Fairgate tested the pistol on something in the room before, like, you know, to get comfortable with the weapon before then, unfortunately, turning it on herself. So, again, we're not out of the woods. This is very much an unsolved mystery, but there's a lot of things that, I mean, you can see why, right? Man, what's just so frustrating to me is that there's, I don't think there was security cameras in the hallway of the hotel. There were in other places, and they but, weren't but either way, they weren't checked. And so it is entirely possible in that 15 minute window, someone knocks, the sound is heard, he looks through the peephole or she, whoever might have done this theoretical assassination. They look through the peephole, they see that person's gone now, they slip out. Bob's your uncle, man. Like, it, it again, both these two theories have so much room for validity to have happened. And again, you're right, the, the, the nebulous term acrid to me is always like a pungent, like, strong foul odor yeah, but you're right it's you're any right. strong it could have odor been gunpowder could oh, have smelled man. some of the leftover food i don't know jeez that's true that is true man so about an hour bratwurst and potato salad so mayo can go bad pretty quick but unless also, it's egg based in which case yeah well, but yeah, i mean also, dang it yeah i don't know i don't know we're circling <laughs> but also like the uh the mayo cologne it could have just been Heavy cologne smell. It's like musk to oh. um. <laughs> you know, oh, there's too much cologne. Right, like right. someone that emptied a whole can of Axe body spray in themselves. They said it was almost empty. They're, Maybe it started brand new, you know. And they said, let's just clean this crime scene out with the yeah. whole body of whatever that scent was. Jupe. <laughs> Dang. I um. I don't know. I still lean towards that. There's so many missing pieces here mm -hmm. on the body itself that it's a great point i think that like those are clear indicators right it's a great point you like, know because before we end this theory i just want to add to that like again this could answer why there were some missing clothing pieces right skirt that roll away case a few other items like that yeah i mean the roll away case could have been used just as like a quick storage getaway thing right let me put i don't know if they use um, things to like drug her or whatever because they only tested for alcohol for some reason. Um, because some stole that stuff in there. It reeks of people behind the scenes. It does. It does. Gosh. But I don't know. Her own like larger luggage could have been used as a storage to True. like get stuff out of the hotel. Yeah. Dang. It's a wild case and somewhat supporting this theory of espionage and being a secret agent is an extremely similar case that I kind of, once again, I like to tease in this show, known as the Isdal Woman, a case that we actually covered here on this show, uh, probably somewhere around episode 30-ish, give or take. But just a very brief synopsis of that case. I believe it happened in the 70s. It was another unnamed woman who also appeared to take her own life in Norway. I think she was found, it looked like she was badly burned by two hikers at the time, and she was just found out in the wilderness. She, too, had removed labels from her clothes, and it is suspected that she may also have been a secret agent. So a lot of similarities, but also a few differences. But just another case that happened not too far away that is worth mentioning. Now, there is one kind of smaller theory that I wanted to mention. It's kind of like a peel off, I would say, of the secret agent stuff, but dropping the idea of being a secret agent. So it's less 
movie fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. So other people who theorize that the Plaza woman was killed suspect that instead of being a secret agent, that perhaps she might have been involved in a crime. To this end, she may have been forced to end her own life, though this theory doesn't expand on what the supposed crime may have been. To fill in the gaps, theorists have concluded that she may have been a sex worker, which could explain her nights away from the hotel room. It also could explain the eclectic assortment of clothing. Or perhaps she was on the run from some sort of crime and it was eventually caught. To conclude this shorter theory, it is thought that maybe her clothing was stolen as proof of her death and that the killer made the Plaza woman's death look like a suicide. While this theory could make some sense, I think it lacks the necessary details and evidence that the other theories seem to lean more on. And to me, this could be meshed kind of into the idea that she was an intelligence agent who was taken out by another spy. It shares a lot of the same footholds, also like, but changes a few things. She was found out why to go, why go to such a public place. Yeah. How did you get into the hotel? Right. Right. Like, if you were a sex worker and you got in is because someone that worked there knew and most like i mean fair chance that they'd come forward and be like look like i knew this person i let them through etc but i mean maybe they just didn't say it out of like i don't know they were just uh embarrassed sure we're just respecting the person's yeah. privacy but then you don't pre you prevent them from figuring out who it is and what happened yeah. and it really, this particular theory mostly leans on the idea that she was seen with a, a man in the uh, lobby, that there's no history here, that no one knows her. It makes a few assumptions, makes a few assumptions about sex workers. And so it's it's missing a lot of yeah, rounded why would, evidence. Why would they not check the damn footage? Especially because like she was seen with a man in the lobby. Right. Footage! Go to the damn camera! What does man look like? To me, one, on one hand, we've seen plenty of cases where things are mishandled and things are not followed through properly. On the other hand, if you're throwing in the idea of there being an intelligence agency, you can see why maybe intentionally they didn't test for certain things. Intentionally, they didn't want her on footage. Intentionally, they obfuscate who she really was and no one was able to come forward because the family was informed and just like mums the word, right? Yeah. So again, it does feel a little fantastic, but it does part of that theory, right? Either way, this is the case of the Oslo Plaza woman, a fantastically intriguing case in a, in a morbid way. Intriguing. But one of those cases, as I almost feel like I'm always ending these with, we feel like we got so close, but I don't know. There's a few questions remaining. What were her connections back to Verlaine? I'm very curious, task force, if you can possibly, there's like a, the hive mind of the task force can figure out if there's any intelligence agencies that also have connections back to this Belgium city. It's a very small town. Why did she check into such a famous hotel? How did she do it without credentials or money? And then on top of that, where was she for that entire 20 hours, that whole evening that she stayed away from this hotel? Either way, this is one of those cases that is still lightly active, and I want to make sure that Task Force, you treat this with respect. If you do have any information, I don't want you know to spam with wild theories or anything like that, but if you do have any information regarding this case, you can email jennifer at vg.no. Once again, that is an actual email, so uh, if you do reach out to them, be sure to be respectful and do not spam them, please. But this has been the Jennifer Fairgate mystery, the Oslo Plaza woman, mystery wild one yeah that one um that one took a turn i didn't think it would that it was going to be like kind of seemed like a missing person case at first where yeah. it's like there was a gunshot and the person's not there and then like there's it was going to be more so like how they get out right um no they were there and uh it was not as clean cut as we thought it would be Mm hmm. gosh oh, good one what was that, almost 30 years ago now? So it's possible that whoever this secret intelligence agent was, if that theory is accurate, could be listening right now. You yeah. son of a gun, put it in your dying testament. I, I want this answered. I want to figure, I want this figured out. I know. I right? feel like on if your I had, way out of this earthly plane. I feel like if I had secrets on my way out, just drop it all right, right then and there. Right. Dang. Anyway, Fredo, I'll see you right back here next Monday for yet another mystery.